So we're at the time right now, 6.30. Thank you for being here. We're going to get started. I hope that your week was uh, full of Old Testament reading, at least uh, in Exodus, because we're going to be going through a bunch of stuff tonight. I know last week was kind of like uh, trying to drink from a fire hose. So this week we're going to try and slow it down a little bit. Um, we went through Genesis, all of Genesis last week. This week we're going to go through all of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua. So we're slowing down a bit, but we're going to spend most of our time in the beginning of Exodus um, because it's the coolest part, right? And uh, so let's uh, begin by a word of prayer and uh, just see what God wants to do tonight. So Jesus, we just thank you. We invite you into this place. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to us in, in ways that maybe we haven't heard before. I pray, God, that the insights from each person in here would be profound tonight. Um, God, even if, even if we may not think they are profound, uh, we know that you can do amazing things and you speak through us. And so I thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last week we left off with the end of Genesis, and uh, we start here in Exodus with the, uh, the death of Joseph and the Israelite people. They are in Egypt, and as we turn now to the book of Exodus, the Israelites, they fulfilled the command in Genesis, which was, what was the first command that God gave the humans? He blessed them first, and then he told them to... Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so that's essentially what they're doing here in Exodus. At the very beginning, they grew in number. But Exodus 1, 8 through 10 begins, Eventually a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He said to his people, Look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king. So Pithom was a store city, a treasure city, and Ramses is the capital that Ramses II, a pharaoh, built for himself. A capital built in the very heart of the Israelite settlement with monumental structures and obelisks, colossal statues of himself like this. Uh, if you were able to see people right here, they would look like ants compared to this. This is an actual picture from, um, I don't know, a couple of years ago or something. Uh, but, but he constructed, had huge huge building uh, feats during his 66-year reign. But uh, the big projects that he had in mind, the growing population of the Israelites, he proceeded to exploit it to the full. He, he enslaved them to the full. So the Israelites enslaved. It says, though, in verse 12, the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites spread. They were enslaved in work groups and gangs uh, that were the main task were digging ditches and brick making. But again, the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread. So then Pharaoh institutes a policy of infanticide. Kill all the newborn baby boys who are Israelites and drown them in the Nile. An ironic method of population control if you begin to think about it, right? Because, like, why would you kill off all the boys if you want to control the population, right? You would want to, you know, get rid of the baby girls because, therefore, they could not bear any more children. So it's ironic. But how would you describe Pharaoh in terms of his character and identity? And I, I'm going to jot these down. What, what would you say? His character, his identity. So evil, right? So we've got Pharaoh. So we've got evil, uh, sociopath, I don't even know how to, sp uh, sociopath, there we go, yeah. What was that? Narcissist. Nar how do you spell that? Sistic, something. Sociopath, is that right? I don't even know how to spell that. It's good enough, you got it, right? Uh, what was else? Someone said something else. Egomaniac, you guys are brilliant. Egomaniac. Okay, what else? 
Other than that, he was a nice guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dick Paranoid. Dictator, yeah. I think that's what you said, right? Dictator, yeah. Okay. Paranoid, okay. Fearful, yeah, good. What was that last one? Oh, you said Dawn? Uh, <laughs> like Dawn, right? Is that what you said? Good. Uh, here's, a, here's a quote from Brevard Childs. He's a famous uh, Old Testament scholar. Pharaoh is portrayed, and I think this kind of encapsulates all the things that you're saying, which are, are brilliant. But a fearful king determined to protect his power by slaughtering the male children that are threatening to him. God's miraculous preservation of one of these children as a redeemer evokes comparisons to the slaughter of the innocent male children of Bethlehem and God's provision for Jesus. So it reminds us, or at least the Christmas story with Herod killing the baby boys, reminds us of Pharaoh killing the baby boys. Well, in addition to this, drowning the Israelite baby boys, I think is ironic because water will actually become the instrument of Pharaoh's own demise as well. And ironically, it was out of the water that Moses was drawn. But like what what was Moses doing with the water in, in the first place? What, what is this baby doing in a basket in the water? First of all, his name is, is Moshe in, in Hebrew, and it means it's from the verb Mesha, meaning to draw, because Pharaoh's daughter drew him out of the water. Uh, his mother uh, tried to keep him quiet for three months. Good luck trying to keep a, a newborn quiet for three months. Yeah. A difficult task, right? But then she decides to put him in a basket made of bitumen and pitch. Have we heard that before in our study through the Old Testament? The Ark, the ark right. The Ark, not the Ark of the Covenant, but the Ark of Noah was fashioned or sealed with bitumen and pitch. So this reminds us back to the story of Noah and the life that was preserved there, the remnant that we talked also about last week. And then she decides to put this basket in a particular location, in the reeds of the riverbank, in a particular spot where the princess would go to bathe. I don't know how that was common knowledge, but apparently Miri, or, um, Jehokbed knew that was where it was best to place the baby. And all the while, the sister, Miriam, stood at a distance to see what would happen. Well, then Moshe is drawn out of the water. Miriam runs and asks, so shall I go get a nurse? from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you. And what happens, Moses' own mother actually gets paid to nurse her own baby. I mean, it's a, it's a wild story. But what do you make of this parenting? What would you say of the mother and also the father who's silent here, uh, their actions? Courageous. Courageous, yeah, what else? Trusting. Trusting. Must have been desperate. That desperate, yeah. What was that? Ordained. 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 They're a genius. Yeah, they're smart, right? They're they're crafty, clever, uh, a little dicey too, right? Like CPS would definitely show up at your house if you were to do this. But it says that when he grew up, he was Pharaoh's daughter's son, the prince of Egypt. Well, Moses is also a murderer as the story proceeds, and according to Stephen's speech in Acts, but also we see it in, uh, in Exodus here, Moses was 40 years old when he went out to his people, saw their forced labor, and looking this way and that, it says, he avenges a Hebrew by killing the Egyptian taskmaster, and then he buries him in the sand. I mean, that's, that's, that'll change you, right? That takes some nerve. Well, it says the next day he uh, tries to intervene in a conflict between two Hebrews who are, are going at it, two Israelite people. And, and they ask him, well, who made you a ruler over us? Maybe he's dressed in his Egyptian garb. Who, who made you a ruler and judge over us? Did you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? So I don't know if like the body gets revealed, the sand gets blown away and... 
But Moses is afraid, and so he flees east to to Midian, and he saves some shepherdesses from some shepherds, and he ends up marrying one of them, Zipporah. But you all know all of this because you, you you read through Exodus. But then later on, as he's shepherding the the flocks of his father-in-law, Jethro, we come to a flaming, talking bush. And so, this is your part. I want you to gather with the people around you and read Exodus 3, 1 through 12 in groups, out loud, and then discuss the following questions. Where is Moses? Why remove the chanclas? And what does the burning bush mean? Chanclas are are sandals, if that's... uh, not your theological grammar right there. So go ahead. So let's explore this together. Where is Moses? Where does it say Moses is? Exactly. What? Mount Sinai, sort of, right? Like it's a little ambiguous. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai. So he's there, but where is this precisely? We don't really, really know. It says in the Hebrew, he's a har midbar. He's behind the desert or the semi-arid steppe or the wilderness. He's off the map. He's off the grid, it seems. Like, where is this? It's no man's land, but he comes, like Jim said, to Sinai, to the mountain of God, to Horeb, which is, you know, it's just a different name for Sinai. It gets used differently in, in different books of the Bible. Uh, Exodus is often called, uh, Exodus often calls it Horeb, whereas Sinai is often the term in, in Deuteronomy. But he comes to this mountain of God, this disputed location. All we know is that we are off the map. We're off the grid. So good, good answer with that one. What about why remove the chanclas? Sandals. Yeah, those are sandals. Like, why remove them? <laughs> his footwear, yeah. his stilettos. I don't know what he was wearing. <laughs> what, what was he? Why remove them? The cultural and religious symbol of reverence and respect. That's brilliant. <laughs> That's brilliant, yeah. Okay, so cultural. I mean, uh, <laughs> holy ground, right? So who in their house takes their shoes off before going in? Some of y'all, right? You should. <laughs> yeah. We started doing it when we brought home a baby from the NICU and we're like, oh, we should probably get clean or, you know, not, I don't know. We just are, I guess we live around a bunch of dirt and dust and so it would get really dirty. So, um, yeah, sure, maybe it's uh, some sign of respect, but, but Moses, he stands before a bush that's fully engulfed in flames and yet it's not burning up. And then the fireball bush just starts talking, Moses, Moses. And he responds with a familiar phrase that the prophets often respond with, he ne ni in Hebrew, here am I. And uh, the bush fireball says, don't come any further, remove your sandals. So he takes them off. But the, the Hebrew reads quite woodenly, the place where you are standing upon, it is holy ground. Now, what's the holiest place you can think of in the Old Testament? Yeah, the Holy of Holies, which is where? The tabernacle or what comes after the tabernacle? It's a, like a permanent building. Yeah, the temple. So in the Holy of Holies, the holiest of holy places in the Old Testament is the temple of Jerusalem. Now, what I think is going on here with the, hey, let's remove your sandals, you know, your chanclas, take them off. This is holy ground. I think this is foreshadowing the tabernacle and the temple. Neither of these have come into play thus far. But I think this is what this story is about. The story parallels Moses to Israel. Basically, what happens to Moses happens to Israel. I would argue that our authors here of of Exodus are showing how Sinai, this mountain of God, or Horeb, also equals Jerusalem. And this place is or is foreshadowing the temple, the temple mount. And Moses, he had to remove his sandals. Why? Because temple priests remove their sandals. They perform their sacred duties in the temple barefooted. There's this long list, if you've ever read through like Leviticus and some of Numbers and some of Exodus, about all of the garb that the priests are supposed to wear. But there's never any mention about their footwear. Never included. 
we have a bunch of Leviticus scholars out up front, I think, who would, who would uh, say that's true as well. But let's go on here. Exodus 3, 7 says, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. It says in your translations, I have surely seen. In the Hebrew, it's I have seen, seen. Like I have really seen. Their, and I've heard their cry. I've seen the affliction. I've heard their cry. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. That's Exodus 3, 7 through 8a and 12b. But Moses then asks for more confirmation. In verse 13, who shall I say sent me? In other words, like, God, who am I supposed to say you are to the people I'm supposed to tell? What's your name, God? But Moses here, he isn't asking God for like a name on a driver's license or a passport information or credit card info. But no, he's asking for the name of God because in the Old Testament, your name represents your presence. Your name represents your presence. So Moses is asking, who are you and are you going to be with me? The name is a part of God's identity, his essence, his presence. And how does God respond? Iehe asher iehe. It's in the future, or you could also see present tense. I will be what I will be, or I am who I am, or I am that I am, or I am that which I will be. Good job making sense of that, right? God just says, I am. God's divine personality can only be known to the extent that God chooses to reveal Himself. Like, it, it can only be revealed on His own terms, not by analogy with anything else. But then what does this burning bush mean? What do you think about that? What were your thoughts? Eternal. Eternal, I like it. Exceptional. Something that you would think in reality it would be burning, but it has to be something that's out of the ordinary to be able to, to be something exceptional. Right. It's, it's out of the ordinary. It's supernatural. It's beyond human conception and maybe even na natural uh, ability. A guiding light. I like it. This could be a, you know, there's a, a bunch of different various interpretations, but it could also be a foreshadowing of the temple and tabernacle as I expressed before. But also as the fire is self-sufficient, it's self-perpetuating, as April was saying, it's, it's just going on. It's not consumed, but it's wholly unaffected by its environment. As the fire is like that, so too is the transcendent and awesome power of God, this eternal flame. But also, you could also interpret this, the lowly bush is like a symbol. A symbol of the pathetic state of the people of Israel and Egyptian slavery, while the fire represents the forces of persecution. But just as the bush remains unconsumed, Israel will not be crushed by its tormentors. So then, well, which one's right? Well, biblical texts can at the same time, you know, have multiple levels of meaning. But Moses is still scared, even after all of this. And so God causes his staff to turn into a snake. He, he causes his hand to turn leprous and then unleprous. And then he, you know, turns water into blood there on the, on the ground. But Mo still says, well, I'm not a good talker. I don't have the gift of gab. I, I can't put words together. Like, what, what does this actually mean though? Does, does he stutter? Or is his Egyptian just rusty? We can't be certain. The two expressions in Hebrew are, are heavy of mouth and heavy of tongue, whatever, whatever that means in Exodus 4.10. So then God tells him, all right, we'll send your brother Aaron to go with you as well. And then they come up against the hardest of hearts. Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Pharaoh refuses. Like, I'm not going to do that. That's my entire workforce. My entire slave, enslaved population who's constructing all of these wonderful things. So I'm not just going to let them go. So Pharaoh refuses, and then God sends a plague, 
And then each time it says, Pharaoh hardened his heart, or God hardened Pharaoh's heart, or it's left ambiguous. So did God condemn Pharaoh by hardening his heart? Was Pharaoh's freedom then overridden? And if so, is that fair? What are your thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to think about that, though. I mean, because if God did harden his heart, then, I mean, obviously God's intentions are beyond what we can understand, but. So we could layer it with that. We're like, oh, God, it's beyond what I can understand, but you must have your, your methods or your reasons. So, But then it, it's it's troubling, right, when we think, well, does God just, like, Zap your, your free will up? It seems like he has a chance, right? Brilliant. Would God know his true heart? I think that's a good insight. You're brilliant, Mickey. And that's why we love having you in this, in this time together. But let's look at this. Let's look at the, um, you know, the numbers, the stats, right? Of the 20 occurrences of the hardening of heart in the book of Exodus, 10 have fully God as a subject. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Four are explicit in making Pharaoh the culprit. Pharaoh hardened his heart. But then six are left ambiguous. It's, it's passive in its formulation, like uh, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. So if we were to do math and say like all six of those times are actually on Pharaoh, it would be equal. Uh, however, the text affirms a couple of things. Number one, that Pharaoh sinned and hardened his own heart, like freely, as we would say. And then secondly, God hardened Pharaoh's heart in order to work his purposes. I think what's helpful in understanding this is that the Jewish uh, theologian Nahum Sarna, who writes, he, that is Pharaoh, is not an innocent, blameless individual whose integrity gets compromised. It's not like he's just this innocent dude and just, you know, his will gets overthrown and then finally subverted or, or overthrown by the invention, intervention of providence or God's protective care or spiritual power. It's not like God just took over and, you know, this innocent man. In brief, the idea of God's hardening the Pharaoh's heart is that he utilizes a man's natural proclivity what Mickey was saying. He utilizes a man's natural proclivity toward evil. He accentuates the process in furtherance of his own historical purposes. In other words, he handed Pharaoh over to Pharaoh's own desires. This is what you want. So here you go. Or Terence Fretheim. God is a God who takes sides. And I, I like this. I like this a lot. God is a God who takes sides. God is the God of the oppressed. God enters into their difficult, suffering situations to set things right. God is a God who is concerned to move people from slavery to freedom. And he does so by the plagues. But let's explore this. Are the plagues a natural phenomenon? You might see this on National Geographic or Discovery Channel or whatever. But, you know, in, in theory, there's nothing supernatural about the first nine plagues could all be explained scientifically. It could all be explained by a natural phenomenon that affects the Nile River Valley from time to time. There's a woman named Greta Hort who actually offers a theory of how a chain of events could explain the natural sequence of the plagues. And before you think like, oh man, I, I'm going to be against her because she thinks this and maybe that would be anti to, to what we see in the text, let's just have an open mind with this. She says it all starts with a, a super heavy rainfall in the East African Plateau near Ethiopia, the highlands of Ethiopia and the Southern Nile Valley. So you're like, I don't know, show me a map. Where is that, right? Like, I don't, I don't necessarily know. It's, it's southeast of Egypt. And now which way does the Nile, this is like Alex Trebek, Jeopardy trivia. Which way does the Nile flow? North. North what? If it, it flows south to north, right? If we're looking on a, a globe, it goes south to the north and empties into the Mediterranean Sea, right? And so 
where this is rainfall is taking place uh, apparently is in the southeastern area so then it's flowing upwards well let's let's look at this so plague number one nile gets turned to blood exodus 7 19. the rise of the river because of this heavy rainfall that takes place uh, in the south it led to tropical earth soil carried from the basin of the blue nile and at bara and it led to the discoloration of the waters to give the appearance of being blood red Oxygen imbalances and bacteria from the high mountain lakes then led to the death of fish. So the water gets turned blood red because of high rainfall and the soil gets washed up upstream. Well, plague two, then the frogs. The pollution of the natural habitat of the frogs is caused by the dead fish. They sought refuge on land, but then were infected by Bacillus anthracis, a disease which would have counted for the wholesale dying of frogs. The disease was widespread because of the masses of decomposing fish, which provided an excellent breeding ground for the disease. And then plague number three, gnats or mosquitoes, you could also translate that as lice in Exodus 8, is caused by the unusual flooding of the Nile. It would have intensified this phenomenon. Then plague number four, flies. Known to multiply and suddenly then just vanish, especially in tropical and subtropical regions. Exodus uh, expresses that the Israelite people are in Goshen. And Goshen gets unaffected, as the story goes, because, well, it's a different climate. It's Mediterranean, not tropical or subtropical. And Greta Hort also cites the specific type of fly. It's like a, a stable fly. And I don't know if you've ever been bitten by a stable fly, but it hurts. Like these are the, the, the blood sucking vicious variety of flies. But plague number five, death or disease of livestock. So waterlogged fields from all the rain and all the runoff from the river overflowing would cause the affluence of this disease, Bacillus anthracis. And then six, it would lead to boils in chapter nine, verses eight through nine. Anthrax transmitted through stomoxys calcitrans by the fourth plague because of the fly bites and then plague number seven hail and thunderstorms well that's a common phenomenon plague eight the locusts also a common phenomenon and then nine darkness could be caused by a hot souther southerly e egyptian wind that blows in from the sahara desert carrying with it sand and dust and the soil then would be released into the atmosphere it would have been extraordinarily dense and abundant blocking out the sun. So a lot to take in there. It's a lot to read, a lot of long scientific names I can't pronounce. But the theory has actually been attacked on a number of grounds, but not for its geology or microbiology. It all fits. It all makes sense. However, the biblical narrative says nothing about a chain reaction or an abnormal flooding of the river but the plagues were the product of God's plan. But I mean, I guess God could actually allow it to happen naturally, couldn't he? Let's take a break and think about that, all right? Ten minutes. When you hear about uh, natural events that, you know, could be fitting in with this story. Rubbish. Rubbish, okay. Okay. What else? <laughs> no, God said he caused, he will, he caused it then, but you could sit there and say like you did, these can all naturally occur. Right. Thus leaving the mystery, it's in many places in the Bible, so if you're not willing to dig deep, you may just think, well, that, that just happened. Okay. Yeah. God didn't have nothing to do with that. Sure. The flies were going to come because they had to flood. Okay. The animals were going to die, blah, 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 because of this and that. And many people do that. Sure. What were you going to say? I was going to say, but it, I mean, yeah, they totally could be natural occurrences, but when else in history has that ever happened? Well, some of these are natural phenomenons. Yeah, but all sequential like that. Yeah. Like, you know, one after another. God said that's it in good. Motion. I don't know. Or God set it all in motion, mm -hmm. and it happened this way. So I don't think these are things that should scare um, individuals who want to look at this as like, this is how it happened, this is what happened, this is what it says, and I believe what it says, you know. 
I don't think that stuff should necessarily scare us or put us off because you just say, well, who, who created nature? Who created the laws of nature and creation? Well, it's God, right? But um, there's also another way of looking at this, the plagues. There are a number of ways, but the plagues could also be, and I really think this is fascinating too, a judgment on Egypt's gods. So Egypt is a polytheistic culture, many different gods. And here's what it says in Exodus 12, 12. The Lord declared, I will execute punishments to all the gods of Egypt. Numbers 33, 4. The Lord executed judgment on their gods. And then Jeremiah 46 talks about plagues as a mockery of Egyptian paganism. So let's take a, a closer look at this. Plague number one, which is the Nile turned to blood in Exodus 7, is clearly an attack on the Nile River. And if you remember anything from world history when you were going through that, uh, the population of Egypt depended desperately upon the Nile River, especially the Nile flooding for its life-giving waters. That would allow them to survive. The Nile was actually deified. It was turned into a, a god uh, for the Egyptians known as Happy. Uh, the god and its flooding was a life-giving act from this deity. It was viewed as also a manifestation of the god Osiris. So the Nile turning to blood must have been locally interpreted as uh, an attack on these two gods. Like either your god is dead or your god is severely disabled and bleeding in a sense. Plague number two, the frogs. Frogs coming out of the Nile, the, the rotting, foul masses of them. It might well have been regarded as a mocking of the, the well-known frog goddess named Hecate, who fashioned humans out of clay at the potter's wheel in the Egyptian creation story. Hecate was also envisioned as a goddess who also assisted women in labor. And uh, so when we think about this, it might cause us to wonder whether the, the bloody waters of the Nile and the plague of the frogs is some sort of retribution for, you know, Pharaoh ordering the baby boys to be drowned in the Nile. Then plague number three, gnats, Kephri, the, the god of rebirth, sunrise, scarab beetles and flies. So what, what's happening here is like there are, are different gods of the Egyptian pantheon who might be... You know, illustrated by each of these plagues, and it's a mockery of them. And it's also showing that they don't have power, they don't have control, like their own things are going against them, if that makes sense. So, because like they're out of control, they're, they're wreaking havoc on the population. So, that would be quite different. So, plague number four flies, Kefri is the same god of rebirth, sunrise, scare beetles, and flies. Plague number five, the disease or death to livestock. Apis is a sacred bull deity among the, the Egyptian people. Plague number six, this is a good one, boils. That would be fun, right? Imhotep is a physician god, a god of, of medicine and healing. And, and Thoth is a god of magic and healing as well. Then plague number seven, hail, nut. She's a, a goddess, the sky goddess. And so when it's hailing, there's no control. Like, it's, it causes destruction. Then plague number eight, locusts. This refers to, you know, like uh, Osiris or Isis, the god of crops, or Set or Seth, the god of chaos. And then plague number nine, this is probably one of the biggest deals, right before the, what we call the, the Passover. Like the Nile, the sun was also paramount in importance in Egypt. It was regarded as the first first uh, king of the land from, from whom all pharaohs descend. So pharaohs, in a sense, are, are demigods or are, are glorified as godlike. But Amun-Ra or Ra is the top god of the Egyptian pantheon, the, the collection of Egypt's gods. He's the source of light and heat and creativity, the symbol of the cosmic order. So when the plague of darkness comes upon the land, it's humiliation of this sun god. And also, like we talked about last week, on what day was the sun created? Do you remember? Day four. It's like, wait a second. If you're an ancient Egyptian reading that text, you're like, my God doesn't get created or the sun doesn't get created until day four. That's a slap in the face. But whatever the interpretation may be, the whole story 
is about a contest between the will of Pharaoh and the will of God. The plagues show Moses and Aaron as superior to Pharaoh and his magicians. And then on a theological level, God has defeated the gods of Egypt, especially with Passover. The last plague is the killing of the firstborn of the Egyptians in specific retaliation for Pharaoh's treatment of Israel. But before that, there's this whole dinner thing. The feast of unleavened bread and the sacrifice of a newly born lamb. Now this newly born lamb sounds brutal, but it has a critical purpose. And this is what it says in Exodus 12. Take a branch of hyssop. That's a particular plant that uh, has a long stem. Dip it in the blood that is in the basin and apply it to the top of the door frame and the two side posts, some of the blood that is in the basin. Not one of you is to go out of the door of his house until morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike Egypt. And when he sees the blood on the top of the door frame and the two side posts, then the Lord will pass over the door. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. When your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then you will say, it is a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover when he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt, when he struck Egypt and delivered our households. So the tenth and final plague in Exodus 11 has no rational explanation. Like we can't get Greta Hort to say, well, this happened and then this happened and this happened. There's, it's supernatural. It belongs to the category of only God can do this. Exodus 12, 29 says, At midnight the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his officials, and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud cry in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. So it finally broke the, the will of Pharaoh. This is not... Aaron or Moses, this is God doing this himself. The once proud monarch was utterly humbled. All of the things that we listed right here, some of them are, are coming true here at the end. The paranoia and the fear get heightened in this. The people then are free to go, he says. But then Pharaoh changes his mind and hotly pursues the Israelites. And Moses and company, they flee. He lifts his staff, extends his hand toward the sea, and God then parts the waters. They travel through dry land, and after making it through, Moses slash God encloses the waters on the Egyptian. There's a passage in John chapter 19 that I think is interesting, a connection. We talked about the hyssop plant. That's what they dipped the blood in and painted their doors with, right? To prevent the destroyer from coming in and taking their lives. Well, John 19 says, A jar full of sour wine was standing there. This is in the event of Jesus' crucifixion. He's on the cross. And it says, so they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. And this is just a passage, a simple word here, hyssop, and it, it triggers something for me. It reminds me back in Exodus about the people painting their doorposts with blood, trying to prevent death. And here we see on a cross, Jesus experiencing death so that we might not. I think it's just an interesting connection there. But then they go for the wilderness wandering. So what do you think of when you hear the word wilderness? I don't think it's a desert. So you think of the desert? Is that what you said? No desert. So no desert. Isolated. That's it? Lost. What? Lost? <laughs> no cell. <laughs> Uninhabited. Start real small, we don't get rated anyway. What was that? <laughs> oh, I'm writing too small. It's okay. In the wild. In the wild. Wildness. Hard to see. In between, desolate, good. I, I, I like it. I mean, th these are kind of some good 
descriptions of what it might be like to be in the wilderness. For the Israelites, it was great. You know, it was great to be out of slavery. You know, you don't have to go, you know, build stuff or get bricks and all of that. But then a month, a mere month after leaving Egypt and the miracle at the sea, the harsh realities of life in the great outdoors set in. And then as they traveled from oasis to oasis, food was in short supply, and then public dissatisfaction grew into a whining complaint. Life was better in Egypt. What? Like you guys, you guys were enslaved. Life was better back there. At least we had meat and bread and melons and cucumbers and food. Well, after leaving Egypt, everything that follows from the Pentateuch or Torah is in the journey toward the promised land. The journey is interrupted, however, by a lengthy stay back at Mount Sinai where God gives Moses the Ten Commandments along with many other laws and detailed instructions concerning religious ceremonies, the priesthood, sacred objects, and the like. But this stop that takes place at the mountain Sinai begins in Exodus 19, and the Israelites, they don't leave until Numbers 10, 12. That's a big chunk of your, of your Bible. It's a big chunk of the Torah or the first five, five books of the Bible. And, uh, this huge chunk, though, I think that also refers to its importance. The themes that mark this section include God's provision and faithfulness. Maybe you've heard the song, It's Raining Men, but it's raining bread here. Manna. Manna was unfamiliar to the Israelites, a substance that was strange. It was called man because they're like, what? When they first saw it, and they said, man who? And the name stuck, which means, what is this? <clears throat> its physical attributes verge on the fantastic. It's been described as flaky like frost or shaped like coriander seed. It was white or like gum resin, yellowish. It tasted like honey-soaked wafers or cakes baked with oil. It could be ground or pounded into a mortar, then baked or boiled. It melted in the sun when it was stored. It rotted or became worm-infested by the next day, unless the next day was the Sabbath except for a, a sample kept in a jar that was eventually placed in the Ark of the Covenant where it lasted for years. So everybody gathered different amounts, but everyone was satisfied. It kind of reminds us of a story in the New Testament with Jesus and some loaves and fish, right? Everyone had all that they needed. Some scholars have identified, though, manna with a natural substance. I mean, people are always trying to look for some sort of naturalistic explanation of things. Uh, the edible sweet excretions of a type of lice found in the Sinai Peninsula. Yum, right? I mean, who knows that they're sweet? Obviously, someone tried to eat this. Uh, so the poop from lice, apparently. <laughs> but, but like the naturalistic explanations of the plagues, this, I think, misses the point. The manna was not a natural phenomenon. It was a supernatural. It's the bread of heaven, as the psalmist describes here in, in Psalm 78. But he, that is God, commanded the skies to open. He opened the doors of heaven. He rained down manna for them to eat. He gave them bread from heaven. This is where we get the English word angel food cake from. I'm not kidding. I'm just kidding. That's not even true. But uh, they ate the food of angels. God gave them all they could hold. So what's the purpose? What's the purpose of manna in the story of the wilderness wanderings? Yeah, God's, God's provision, surviving, great. Any other ideas? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. What about any New Testament connections? I mentioned the loaves of bread and fish, but I think there's one that's a lot clearer than that. Daily bread. Good. Last Supper. Yeah, and, and the idea of communion. What was that? Yes, Jesus himself in John chapter 6 says, I am the... The bread of life. I am the bread of life. And I, I think he's talking about Exodus and the wilderness wanderings and God's provision. And so when we, you know, as Milo was talking about with this act of communion, when we are consuming Jesus in our lives, that is a sustaining thing. We also see him as the, the living water and so on and so forth. But it, I think, proves to be an example of God's care for them during their journey from the time of Exodus until the time they enter the land. That's how long the manna continues to, 
to drop or, or continues to come up with, with the dew each morning. And we've also got dive bombing quail. Exodus 16, 13. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. Apparently, they weren't on the menu every single night, but it sure was a nice break from the manna. Quail have been known to migrate in huge flocks from Europe to Central Africa in autumn and return in the spring. These short-tailed game birds, they fly rapidly at low altitudes. I don't know if you've ever seen them when you're on the hiking trail or something, but, but due to these long distances that they travel, their migration it takes place in stages. So twice a year, small quails land exhausted on the Mediterranean shore where they can easily be captured even by, by hand or in nets in great quantities. Uh, their flesh, their eggs are apparently a, a fine delicacy in Europe today. But the season in which the Israelites were traveling and encountered the quail, it fits in precisely with the bird's migratory pattern. So the natural background of this story is, is well attested, it's well established. But then we also, as Glenn was saying, who's responsible for the natural and the supernatural? Well, that's God. Talk about supernatural. How about water from rocks? Go ahead, turn to the people next to you and read Exodus 17, 1 through 7. And then look at these questions. Why water from a rock? Why Horeb? Why strike the rock when later only need to speak of it? And why recall the Nile miracles? A lot there to explore. So get to it. All right, so let's bring it back here together, and uh, we'll go forward with this. So water from the rock. I mean, that's like the most impossible thing you could think of, right? Like water coming from rocks. And now that clears up the question of God's power. I mean, the people are complaining, God, you know, Moses, you want to kill us, and God, where are you, all this stuff. Well, the water from the rock clears up that. Now, doing it at Horeb, also known as Sinai, was significant because it was there that Moses was previously called. Remember in chapter 3? And he was told long ago, pre-Exodus and escape from Egypt, that he would bring them to this place. But since they doubted that God would you know, provide, that God was in, his, in their midst, he would not do this miracle in the camp, but would have Moses lead the leaders out to Horeb slash Sinai. Now, striking the rock, what do you think about this one? And, and recalling the Nile miracles. Why, why recall the Nile miracles and strike the rock? They're doubting, but why even talk about the Nile? The Nile's way back in Egypt. Any thoughts there? What's that? They were led out of Egypt, so it's, it's instrumental in that. Yes. Good, good. So recalling devastation, that's important, I think, uh, because right here, striking the rock recalls striking the Nile. Puts a staff, strikes the Nile. There it brought death to Egypt, as Jody was saying. But here, it brings life to Israel. Different place, but striking with the staff. But it's clear, God is with them and able to provide for them. The Lord provides manna and quail and water for the people. He also provides, as the story goes on, a way for them to be together in community. Ten do's and don'ts. So they're going to be at Sinai for a year, and here Moses makes up a, a bunch of a trips up and down the mountain to go meet with God. And then in Exodus 20, God gives them the Ten Commandments. So let's see if we can name them all without even without cheating. What do we got? Know the gods before me. No images or idols, yeah? Yeah, the Sabbath, keep it holy. What? Don't, don't do murder. Honor your mother and father. That's five. What? Don't steal. Don't covet. Those are different, right? Don't like cover your neighbor's donkey or Escalade or Porsche or whatever. What else? Don't bear, false don't bear false witness. Like don't lie. Don't commit adultery. What else? One more. Misuse of 
Yes, don't use the Lord's name in vain. Very good, very good, brilliant. We got them all. But God here provides a barit, a covenant or a contract, a relationship, a marriage for the Israelites, and they enter into this covenant together. Terence Fretheim has this brilliant quote here, I think, that sums up Exodus with the ten do's and don'ts, with the plagues, with the escape from Egypt. The movement in the book of Exodus is a whole as a whole, is one from slavery to worship, from service to Pharaoh to service of God. And then we move on to Leviticus, everyone's favorite. And there's strange laws when it comes to Leviticus. Leviticus has much to say about holiness. Like, what's your first perception when you think of Leviticus? Rules. Rules, right? (laughs) That part of the Bible you never touch. What else? Like, Anyone had deep devotions in Leviticus lately? God speaking to you through that? You're just trying to like use it to like misprove someone on Facebook or something, right? Like this is what it says in Leviticus. I don't know why it says that, but this is what it said, right? What else? What else do you think of with Leviticus? There you go. I mean, Leviticus has much to say though also about holiness. We're going to talk about that holiness. And holiness means like being set apart for God, something special, something sacred. There's also dietary restrictions. Like, I mean, today our world is full of dietary restrictions. Like, who's paleo? Who's vegan? Who's vegetarian? Who's, I don't even know, uh, Atkins diet? Is that thing still going on? I I think that got renamed as keto, so. um, I mean, dietary restrictions, though, for the Israelite people were for hygienic reasons like there's some animals you don't want to eat guys and they're eating them in the ancient world you don't want to eat those sometimes it's for religious or ethical or symbolic reasons these laws were for life in the ancient world and also laws for people who are nomadic so sometimes when we see the the utmost uh brutality of some of these laws we're like man these god is freaking mean well, we also have to consider these are a traveling people. Like, you're not going to go put someone in jail if you're traveling. Like, how do you do that? You know, so some of them were, were tough sentences for things that may not seem as big of a deal, but maybe they are. And also, sometimes these laws are deterrents. Like, don't do this or else this is the consequence. I mean, we got a three-year-old, so we're trying to do that as well. And maybe we need to do some studying in Leviticus here. But these are some of the strangest laws that, that I just think are, are funny in Leviticus. We've got Leviticus 19, uh, 27, I, I like to call it, tell the barber to take it easy on the sides law. So not too many people prefer the reverse mohawk look. Imagine that, re- reverse mohawk. But apparently God does. In Leviticus 19.27, the prescribed holy haircut involved not cutting the hair on the sides of the head or trimming the edge of the beard. This look would help the Israelites stand out from the people of other nations. I mean, I think that's naturally what happens as well. Uh, That naturally happens too as well. Uh, Or how about Leviticus 22.24, that don't sacrifice animals with damaged testicles law. Leviticus 22, 24, you must not offer to the Lord an animal whose testicles are bruised, crushed, torn, or cut. Ouch. It kept the Israelites, though, from attempting to offer animal sacrifices, you know, animals that couldn't reproduce or animals that were less valuable. You know, it's like, ah, I don't want this anymore, so I'm going to give it to goodwill, right? Or I'm going to give it to charity, this you know, who does that? Like a Toys for Tots thing. It's like, ah, my kid's through with this, so I'm going to give it away. Like, you don't do that. I mean, re-gifting, I don't know if that's a sin. It's not one of the Ten Commandments, but don't do that to God. <laughs> Leviticus 19.28, no in memory of tattoo. I don't like this. Christians, they cite, some Christians cite Leviticus. Oh, you shouldn't have tattoos, it says in the Bible. I'm like, really? Is that what it says in the Bible? Because this verse actually refers to pagan rituals that were performed over the burial of their dead. So, I mean, they would cut themselves, they would paint themselves, all this stuff. But this verse is prohibiting worldly pagan rituals that the nations outside of Israel had as tradition. I mean, what are some of our worldly pagan rituals? Super Bowl, 4th of July, Christmas, trees, right? I mean, there's a lot of different things that that we could consider 
as worldly or even pagan, whatever. Um, but it all, I think, boils down to what Leviticus talks about and why it's so important is this deal about loving your neighbor. I mean, Jesus cites it, so I think it's probably pretty important. Leviticus 19, 13 through 18 talks about don't be partial toward the poor, use justice, don't slander, don't hate, don't take vengeance, love your neighbor as yourself. And then in Deuteronomy, we hear in, in chapter 6, this command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And that's the summary of the Old Testament. Everyone thinks the Old Testament is about an angry God who destroys people all the time because they made like one error. But it's all summed up in loving God and loving your neighbor. Luke 10, Jesus puts these two commands side by side and says these are the most important things, to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So Leviticus puts us in the thick of an elaborate system of ritual and purity and stuff that involves all different aspects of life. It comes from a, a culture that's very different than our own. Very different. It has its own codes, it has its own values. But what I see in the law is what's called incarnational, how God comes to us in human forms, like human shapes and institutions, working through human sinfulness and imperfections to bring about his purposes. And I love that God is willing to work through human brokenness, that God doesn't require perfect people to work out his perfect plan. And he's even willing to work through whining and complaining, like the book of Numbers, which actually is called in the wilderness in the Hebrew title. Numbers sounds terrible and everyone avoids it, but Numbers is actually a really cool book. Uh, there's a lot of awesome stuff in there. It tells about how God's people traveled from Mount Sinai to the border of the Promised Land. There's a lot of battles. There's a lot of crazy stuff with snakes that happen. Uh, when they refused to take possession of the land, God made them wander in the wilderness for nearly 40 years. And then it ends with this new generation about to enter into the Promised Land. The old generation dies out. So throughout the book, God is one who cannot ignore rebellion and unbelief, but he's also one who faithfully keeps his promises, his covenant, and, and he patiently provides for the needs of the people. And then on to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, we just finished a sermon series called Called to Faithfulness, and I think that's what it's really all about. It wraps up the story of Israel's wandering in the wilderness, and, and Moses, he calls the people together. It's also known as Moses' final you know, speech or sermon to the people. It's called the second law. But he gives them God's instruction for the life in the land of Canaan. But its primary message through and through is love. Not a list of do's and don'ts, not legalism, but a relationship. And then we exit the Pentateuch or the Torah and we come to the book of Joshua, a bloody book, if you've ever read it. A troubling book as well. But Joshua deals with the land, and the basic premise is that through a string of military victories, Joshua, who's Moses' successor, he leads a unified Israel, all 12 tribes, to conquer and then divide the promised land among the 12 tribes. In these battles, though, it becomes clear that, that God fights for the people. He fights for them when they're strong and courageous and when they put their full trust in Him that God is, is a divine warrior who fights for Israel. And so as a summary, we've seen God save his people. We've seen him save his people from slavery. We've seen God refine his people. We've seen God make his will known and God give his people the land. It reminds me of Luke chapter 9, verse 28 through 31, all of this talk that we've kind of had this theme of the exodus the entire time. Escape, right? Luke 9, this is the uh, Mount Transfiguration, the moment where Jesus is transfigured. He becomes, looks different, glorified in a sense in front of his, his pals. It says, about eight days later, Jesus took Peter, John, and James up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared and began talking with Jesus. So those are representative of the law, Moses and Elijah, the prophets, who we're going to explore next week. They were glorious to see, and they were speaking about his exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled 
in Jerusalem, referring to his death and his resurrection. The gospel stories, the mission of Jesus, our lives today, it's all about Exodus. God saves his people from sin, from slavery and death. God refines his people. God makes his will known. God gives his people the land, the heavenly homeland. And I think that our lives in the middle of this exodus have great opportunity. And yet sometimes we find ourselves like the people in the wilderness, wandering, complaining, arguing, falling away. But their story is our story. And we see ourselves, I think, clearly in it sometimes Mm -hmm. on good days and bad days. And so may you experience the exodus that God has for each and every one of us wholly, intimately and powerfully. To see yourself in this story, as I see myself in this story, to realize that, man, like, God has called us out of slavery and sin and death, metaphorically or even, <laughs> even very uh, literally. Literally. And then we just keep messing up sometimes, but that's what we're going to explore next week with Judges, 1 Kings, and Isaiah. So next week we're going to explore the pattern of how Israel gets shaped in the land. So they they experience the time of, of being led by local leaders, and then kings, and also prophets all the way through. And so the reading next week is going to be shorter. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be some good reading. These are my favorite stories, I think, in... uh, this particular type of literature. And then there will be a Bible project video or two. I hope that you have checked those out. If you haven't, do. They're really good and they're awesome. They, they uh, you know, help supplement or even just make it a lot more clear. Um, but what questions do you have tonight? We have some time to explore a couple questions. I know it's always like the wrong thing to do to ask questions at the end of a session because people want to go and all that. But um, any questions on what we've explored tonight that you think is, is fitting for the group? To discuss. Or areas of, you know, hey, can you clarify what you said? Because it didn't make sense. Or we can talk after. Yes? Is it, is it just me, or did Moses seem to, like, not need Aaron after a while? Like, he seemed to gain confidence a bit more in God and in his faith? Yeah, exactly. That's a great, great insight. He does fade to the background as the story goes on. And so it's like Moses is an excellent uh, example for, for looking at leadership. He actually identifies a lot of the different categories of priest and prophet and king. He's an individual who has equipped with a lot of different things, but humility as well is important. And, but he grows in stature and he grows in wisdom and becomes kind of his own person and finds his own voice. And at which point Aaron, Aaron and Miriam, they, they do challenge him at times and God turns her into a leprous uh, white (laughs) individual for a time and it sucks but um, he becomes almost larger than life but yeah he finds himself great question yep so yeah Moses doubting himself for sure I mean that's a natural experience anyone else thoughts insights New discoveries, old discoveries that. Good. Can we just talk about Moses and how he came down from the mount? He was glowing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's what happens. His face was glowing. Um, He had experienced God. It's very much like Jesus in the Transfiguration. Um, Yeah. Like Paul talks about it, I think in Corinthians or something. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much for your attention tonight.